good morning or good afternoon or good evening um, the meeting house in waterloo region wherever you find yourself whether that's in cambridge or kitchener or waterloo or wellesley woolwich new dundee i hope there's not another township i'm missing maybe there is um I'm really excited for this God Only Knows series uh, where we kind of go, um, whoever's teaching what's been on our minds and our hearts and our souls um, as as we've been, you know, journeying along and where we find ourselves. And I'm really, really grateful for uh, Bruxy's teaching last week. So if you didn't check out Bruxy's teaching last week, I please, 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 I encourage you to do so. I, um, it was something I needed to hear and it was something that was really cool because, uh, I was planning on <laughs> kind of picking off where he left, picking up where he left off. I didn't really know exactly what Bruxy was going to be teaching on, uh, but I'm, I'm really grateful that it lined up really well with what I want to share with you, um, right now. Brux shared about, um, the word Katerizo the mending of the disciples' nets, but also how that word is used uh, throughout the New Testament with with training of the disciples, with bringing about unity in the church um, and equipping the saints uh, for the work of of ministry and this this repairing and preparing uh, how this word is is used and diving into strong and weak in Romans 14 and 15 and, and what that means. Um, what it meant for the church then that Paul uses um, food sacrifice to idols and and how you know um, the group of weak people have their foot one foot in the Old Testament or Old Covenant laws uh, one foot in the New Testament of grace and kind of being stuck a bit in their rigidity uh, and the strong recognizing where grace can work and flow and um, you know, if you're in a person's home and you don't know where their food was sacrificed to, you can you can put that aside and have grace for, for the people in front of you. I know I'm simplifying things a bit, but looking at the strong and the weak, and then also to Jesus's prayer for unity at the uh, in, in John 17, um, where Bruxy shared about that and trying to be a people of unity uh, with people who are strong, people who are weak, whatever that means, whatever that looks like, in whatever context we find ourselves in. Um, and yeah, this this prayer that we ended with, with, which is, Father, please help us be one, even as you and Jesus are one. Bring us your church to complete unity so that the world will believe in the truth of Jesus and in your love for them. Which is a beautiful prayer and I, this morning, wanted to, this morning, wherever time, whatever time it is you find yourself in uh, when you're watching this, um, building on this with practical, tangible steps. Um, and what we're looking at this morning is actually postures. Uh, and I'm using the phrase postures of ministry because I've, I've borrowed much of this from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which is actually one of the quotes if you read your teaching notes very carefully last week. Uh, and, and we'll get to um, that Bonhoeffer quote later. Um, but the question is, how do we go about being Christ's service, servants in the world, bringing about unity in the church? And so we're going to look at these postures today. And how we're going to do this, at least when we do this live, I'm going to have a series of um, verses that people can read through. And so if you want to pause the video right now, if you're um, at a home church or you're at home and want to read through this yourself at your own pace, go for it. Or if you are uh, gathered together as a home church for watching this teaching together, you could pause it and have different people read. I highly, highly encourage hearing different people's voices. I'm going to read through these texts right now, uh, but you can skip ahead in the video after I've read it and pick up there. So if you're going to pause, pause. And if you're not, here's, here's me reading the texts. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. 
And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. That's from Luke 10, 46 to 48. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? And that's from James 4, 11 to 12. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. That's from Romans 12, verse 3, and then verses uh, 14 to 16. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. It's from James 1, 19, and then verses 26 and 27. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the road. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went, him, went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Luke 10, 30-35 Brothers and sisters, if anyone, someone, is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. This one's a bit of a doozy from uh, Ezekiel chapter 3. about him being a watch tower for Israel or a watchman. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the words I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life. That wicked person will die for their sin. And I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do, but if you do warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or their evil ways, they will die for their sin but you will have saved yourself. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Oh, here we go. Again, when a righteous person turns from their righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before them, they will die. 
since you did not warn them, they will die for their sin. The righteous things that person did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the righteous person not to sin, and they do not sin, they will surely live because they took warning, and you will have saved yourself. And here's our last text for today. So, Creator sets free, Jesus, called them together and said, Other nations have rulers, such as the people of iron, Romans. They like to show their power over people and push them around. But this will not be the way of the ones like you who walk with me. The great ones among you will humble themselves and serve all the others. In the same way, the true human being did not come to be served by others, but to offer his life in the place of many lives to set them free. It's from Mark 42 to 45 from the First Nations version, which I've really, really been enjoying of late. All right. I know that was a lot of text, and I really, really generally don't like to preach on a smattering of different texts, and I really, really, really don't like sermons or teachings that are book reports on other books, but I am very happy to tell you that I am breaking both of those rules today um, and lifting a lot of this from Bonhoeffer, and I think it's deeply, deeply practical for us as believers trying to live out unity and um, totally jumping off from, from last week's teaching. And so we're calling this postures of ministry, how to go about being the people of God in the world and living as a church that seeks out unity. However, instead of starting at the place of Jesus and his prayer, I'm starting at the place of the disciples and their argument um, I like some of the older translations, um, or a handful of different translations, which, which, which have Luke 9, um, 46 as this. There arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest. And I think it's, it's funny um, that usually it's you know, an argument. Um, but I think the word reasoning here is actually... Um, much much more telling. Uh, I'm not going to dive into the Greek, but it's it is more reasoning than it is just a straight up argument. And I think that this is how we all, when we think of ourselves as better than someone else, it is purely us rationalizing why we are a better person and why they are a worse person. Um, it can be for whatever reason, in whatever circumstance, at whatever age you find yourself. Um, children on a school ground found find a pretty quick pecking order right away. Um, and even in churches, no matter how big or how small, the second um, you see someone, you can leverage who you are, you know, against them. And... This happens with the strong and the weak, we could say, with people who are gifted or not gifted, with people who are more simple, people who are more difficult, people who are devout or less devout, people who are sociable, people who are solitary. You can leverage your weakness against someone's strength or your strength against someone's weakness. Or most simply, just think of somebody that you do not like. <laughs> um, my assumption is that we all do this rationalizing that the disciples are doing. I think we do characterize the disciples quite fairly most of the time as bumbling idiots walking around trying to figure out what Jesus is doing. And here, I think we, we do that too soon. I don't think we empathize quickly enough with his, the reasoning and rationality that's going on around here. And how do we counter this? This is what I want to get to. Um, we read from... Uh, James, and I do like James holding our tongue. James also talks about the our tongue being the the ship, the the stern of stern. That's the thing that 
twist the ship the back of the ship that shifts the direction of where the ship goes um one of the most useful things is just simply again holding one's tongue pausing not talking sometimes the bad thoughts we think are just a lot better if we never say them out loud um it also helps us not scrutinize, not judge, not condemn when we don't allow those things to come out of our mouth and we pause and we see the person in front of us as someone who is a free individual. And what I mean by that is I mean that they are an image bearer of God. Um, and this is part of the quote that, that came from, from last week, if you if you read your teaching notes quite carefully. This is from Life Together by Bonhoeffer. God does not will that I should fashion the other person according to the image that seems good to me, that is in my own image, rather in his very freedom from me, God made this person in his image. I can never know beforehand how God's image should appear in others. And indeed, uh, Bonhoeffer continues on to talk about how if Christ's likeness and image is in someone else, it's, it's hard for us actually to, to recognize Christ as he became this gross and despicable image on, on the cross. And that's not what we expect even God to be like. So we must, must, must um, see um, the imageness, the the way in which someone bears God's image, Christ likeness, um, as hard as I can, as hard as I can be at times. Um, this holding one's tongue is a, is a very good posture. Meekness, obviously, in some of the mounts, you know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But uh, we read in Romans. Um, as we were reading too about having this sober judgment um, and and seeing ourselves with this sober judgment, not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Uh, in in First Timothy as well too, Paul, which we didn't read this morning, um, Paul talks about seeing himself as essentially the greatest of, of the sinners. Um, and so if we live as people, who are living by the forgiveness of our sins, of our sin in Jesus. Um, we meekness is not weakness. Meekness is recognizing, you know, the, the strength that we have in Christ, and it's because of His grace and because of His forgiveness. But it means we remain deeply humble. And, and so the question we can ask ourselves is: Here is, can I possibly serve another person with genuine humility? If I think that their sinfulness is worse than my own, I, I think that's a very good question. Um, and I think this posture of meekness is, is something that we must strive for um, as we work against these reasonings, um, these reasonings that, that put ourselves above others um, and helps us develop this, this posture of of the way of Jesus. Listening. Consider um, our text from James uh, 1, 19. What did we read from James 1, 19? We read, Dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to be angry. And it continues on. This posture of listening um, maybe seems, you know, too obvious, too quick um, to state. But I will say that Christians, and especially pastors, so often think we must always contribute our voice. So often we must think we must say something. Um, and we need to turn from that and recognize that listening can be so much greater than speaking. And this one's harder. We need to stop half listening to people. 
we think we know what someone else is saying, and so we half listen so we can, you know, just keep the conversation going and then say what we really want to say, right? Right? Um, this is a terrible, terrible practice. This is something that deeply undermines, um, again, I'll say the imageness in, in someone else. And as sisters and brothers in Christ, um, we want to be um, listening deeply to one another. Uh, and, and I'll say here too that listening to the little things well often leads to listening to the greater things, to the important things, to uh, confession um, to one another. And, um, and we'll get to some speaking into one of those lives, but first we must begin practicing this, this listening. Helpfulness. This is a good practice. Um, we read of the um, parable of the Good Samaritan. And, and the joke here is that, you know, maybe the Levite, as he's walking along, he's reading his Bible, you know, and walks past. And so this, this posture of, of helpfulness is, are we helping others in simple, trifling, external ways? This can be very, very simple things. Um, it does not need to be grandiose gestures like holding up someone in a hotel um, when they're sick. It can be, it could be, um, but it could be making a meal for someone. It could be helping someone just clean up. It could be whatever, shoveling the driveway. It could be simple trifling things that other people need. And us, me, not being too good or too important, thinking of myself more highly than I ought, right? Thinking my time is more valuable um, because God so often works in the interruptions. When we are present to other people, um, when we're present in whatever spaces we need to be in, helpfulness is, is a very um, simple, tangible thing that as we do this with our bodies, it also shapes our hearts and our minds as we are become people of God. It is not just a cerebral thing. It is a whole body physical thing. Um, and so we got to do that. All right, bearing, bearing with one another. Uh, this is actually, again, both a little bit on the, can be trite or simple, but also very, very heavy. Um, we didn't read from Isaiah 53, uh, but Isaiah 53 is all on about uh, the suffering servant in Christ being the suffering servant. We didn't read from Ephesians 4, but talking about speaking um, truth um, in love and also uh, bearing one another's burdens, which we, we definitely read in Galatians 6. And I think that if we are not actually bearing with other people, again, if we don't have that posture of, of listening or, or half listening, um, if we aren't um, doing those things, so often we are just treating other people as objects to be manipulated, to do the things that we want them to do, that they are formed in the image that we want them to be formed in. And so as we talked about the, the freedom of other people, that is actually a burden because someone else's freedom collides with our autonomy. Um, this uh, autonomy is something we'll, we'll come up against. Um, and, and humanity has been, this, this is, this is the fall, um, our autonomy wanting to be like God. And we'll talk more about that later, but, um, more than just the freedom of another person, which is a burden because I can just be the things in their personality that we just don't like so much. And that's just their freedom of being them. Um, and that collides with, cause it's not the way that we want them to be, um, but we continue to be with them. But this sin of another person, the way in which that can damage and tear down and break apart friendships and relationships and destroy trust, the sin of another person is a much harder burden to bear. Um, but when we bear that with someone else, that is us participating in God's beautiful works of grace. Um, grace becomes plain in those situations because um, we are people who are 
who know of Christ's bearing of our sin. And when we know that Christ is the one who has borne our sin, um, and we participate in the bearing of one another's sin, we humbly, humbly know that we can be borne by others. Um, we know that we can actually be um, forgiven by others as they forgive us as Christ has forgiven us. And it's, this is, you know, you could sum the whole work, all of salvation as Christ bearing our sins. And so us participating with Jesus and bearing one another's sins is a beautiful thing. Proclaiming this ministry sounds scary because it sounds like Billy Graham at a massive conference that you need to proclaim the gospel to other people. Um, but this kind of proclaiming that I'm talking about is this communication of the word, the communication of spirit-filled words to another person, be they comfort, be they um, admonition, be they kindness, be they severe words. Um, we, we read about Ezekiel as this watchman for Israel, and he spoke the words he needed to speak. Um, and it is really hard to speak these words into other people. Because for those people whom we have already listened to, whom we've already been helping, whom we've already been bearing with, um, for us to speak, um, even if it's words we feel that the Holy Spirit wants us to speak into someone's life, we are afraid. And so we suppress these words and we keep them inside. Why? Because we're afraid what someone will think of us. You know, who am I to be judge, right? Which is that holding our tongues, which is that meekness, right? Who is our conceit? Or, or are we afraid of, of being conceited ourselves? Not just them, you know, not, not us being afraid of them and what they think of us, but what we think of ourselves. How can I, you know, speak um, uh, severely into someone else or admonish someone else? Um, or even we might be afraid for some reason to comfort them. It happens. And so the, the words of, of Cain, am I my brother's keeper, um, come to mind. And, and I, 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 I hope that's rhetorical. Um, for those for whom we love, we are. Um, here's another quote from Bonhoeffer, and then, and then we'll almost wrap up here. The more we learn to allow others to speak the word to us, to accept humbly and gratefully even severe reproaches and admonitions, the more free and objective we will be in speaking ourselves. Nothing can be more cruel than the tenderness that consigns another to their sin. Nothing can be more compassionate than the severe rebuke that calls a sister or brother back from the path of sin. And if you thought the last one was scary, this one actually flips um, something that might sound scary upside down, which is usually how Jesus works, which is this ministry of authority or this posture of authority. And we, we read from uh, Mark 10 um, that we are a people, it is not so with you. Um, people who use power and assert it over others. Jesus makes authority dependent on serving one another. The church does not need brilliant personalities, but faithful servants of Jesus. Not seeking power for ourselves, but submitting to each other and to Jesus, who alone has the authority over all things. So, as we've gone through this list, maybe this is long, maybe this is heavy, um, but I think these postures... Um, really point to a Jesus-centered life. And we've talked about our vision in the past, in this fall, um, to introduce spiritually curious people to the Jesus-centered life through movement of Jesus-centered churches. And I, I think that if we are embodying these things, um, wherever we find ourselves, 
um, at whatever stage of life we're in, um, in whatever situations we're in, these postures point to a Jesus-centered life, um, and and they show it. And um, yes, these must happen. These must happen among sisters and brothers, among one another in the church. Um, and these are things that we can be living out in the world as we go and are invited into other spaces as well, too. And so we'll pray again um, the prayer uh, from last week. Um, and we'll add to it. So we'll say, Father, please help us be one, even as you and Jesus are one. Bring us, your church, to complete unity so that the world will believe in the truth of Jesus and in your love for them. And Jesus, um, we pray too that you would help us hold our tongues when we really, really, really need to hold our tongues. But also, in the moments in which we just need to exercise caution, um, when, when we're tempted to judge someone else and have a reasoning among ourselves, that this practice of holding our tongue um, would cause us to slow down and see your image um, in the other. And we, we pray that you would help us be people who are meek, um, this, this beautiful posture and practice of meekness, that we would not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, um, that we would be changed and shaped and transformed uh, by you and know that you are the one in whom we have our strength and that we don't need to assert ourselves over and above other people. Jesus, I pray that you would make us a listening people, um, that we um, would know that the love of our, of our siblings in Christ uh, and the love of those who do not yet know you uh, begins with listening to them, Jesus, and that we would be listening to you. Uh, that our love of you starts with listening to your word and listening to your spirit. I pray you to help us be people of helpfulness, not thinking again of, our, of ourselves or of our time too greatly, that we would allow ourselves to be interrupted by you, um, that little things, um, that we would see them as important, little simple ways of helping other people. And Jesus, this posture of bearing with one another, which can be so hard um, because we'd rather just ignore people. We'd rather just ignore even people who are, are close to in their difficult times. Um, and so teach us to, to bear with one another, Jesus, as you um, are the one who bears with us. Help us not be afraid to proclaim, Jesus, your truth, your life, your love, and your way into the lives of those around us. And Jesus, may we know and live as people who have authority. And may we recognize that this authority is not a kind of authority that is over top of someone else and is dominating from above and is coercive, but is this great posture of service, is this great posture of, of these things, of listening, of helping, of bearing, um, and of speaking into the lives of our brothers and sisters. So help us, Jesus, as we strive to be your people. Amen.